Um, one time I, I was having a very philosophical discussion with friends of mine late in the evening after much wine, and, um, and my base was nearby, and they finally got disgusted listening to me sound off on this and talk on this, and they said, for God's sakes, Gary, why don't you shut up and just play? <laughs> goes back seven generations of double basses. <laughs> and uh, when I grew up in my family, there were about five or six double basses. My grandfather played the bass, my uncle. My father finally had to study the double bass in self-defense after he married into my mother's family, who were the musical ones. And I had a couple of cousins playing double bass, so I was surrounded by all this double bass sound. I gotta have another fix. Could I draw that low A again? Oh, sure. Yeah. Who wants to join me? Come on, Leslie, let's get our heart. Come on, Judy, you haven't felt, you don't, I mean, what do you know? A puny violin doesn't yeah. do anything. Come on. I I draw, <laughs> stand up to this, Judy. Stand up and tell me what you think. That's very good. <laughs> I could lean up against it all night. <laughs> my grandfather was the most influential uh, member of my family. Uh, I think he was the most musical, the most philosophical. He always told me that, that music is, is the, the language of the soul. And in fact, I remember an experience where I was practicing one time on a, on a page that had looked like a coal mine you've never seen so many black notes and I was scrubbing away really working so hard and and I thought I was really doing well and my grandfather was sitting there listening to me as he often did and he came over to me and he suddenly slapped me across the face and I I can't tell you first of all how I love my grandfather I mean it's it, our relationship was so close and when he did that I of course began to cry I was only about 10 years old and I said grandpa how could you what have I done why did you do that and and he walks over to the music and he takes his finger and slowly lets it rest upon one note. And he said, you played that one note without feeling. Don't you ever do that again. <laughs> so as a result of this, my grandfather's influence, all the people that I was attracted to later on were people who approached music with this tremendous emotional intensity. family came over from Russia to America in 1918, the time of the Bolshevik Revolution. They were lucky to get out. Uh, they came through Shanghai and then eventually ended up in New York and around 29, the Depression moved out to California where I was raised.
I began studying when I was nine, and the experiences which, which I think probably molded what I'm doing more than anything else uh, was having listened to people sing. For instance, my mother, who plays the oboe, sings when she plays the oboe. She sings through the oboe, and I think that was the that for me was the earliest musical experiences I think that influenced my life. Performing recitals, people tend to be very snobbish about it. I think in big cities sometimes, uh, and I and I'm much more at ease. Uh, I like to. I, I feel more comfortable uh, performing in places that are not so so pseudo sophisticated, you know. And I and one of those places is Galveston, Texas, that has an incredibly beautiful opera house. I would say one of the most sophisticated structures I've ever performed and sophisticated because it just makes any sound glorious in there. And it must have been built with that in mind. And the people there will come and they'll, they'll listen to anything. They don't care whether I'm playing uh, Bottasini or Schubert. They love them all. I met Harmon um, well over 10 years, a decade ago. Um, I was teaching at Indiana for University during the summer, and Harmon was getting his doctorate. He's now a, a doctor of music, and I'm only, uh, well, actually, we're going to change the name of the duo. We're going to call it Dr. Lewis and Mr. Carr. Uh, but a doctor means that he knows everything there is to know about music, and I know all the rest. 
Um, anyhow, <laughs> I met him in Indiana because of this one thing about my high school music teacher. I kept asking everybody, isn't there anybody around here I can play some Baroque music with? Doesn't anybody read figured bass, you know, the, the bass line with all the numbers on it, under it? Can't anybody improvise in that period? And um, us the usual response, well, I don't know, we'll have to look around. And suddenly someone came up to me and said, Harmon Lewis, have you heard him? And I said, who is he? And he said, oh, this guy, when he does a figured bass, it's unbelievable. He's so creative and he's so imaginative. You've got to get, get together with him. So we met and we played together. It was terrific. I mean, it was back to high school, only even better. It was much more fun. So we were made to work together. I had just finished the examinations, the qualifying exams for my doctorate at Indiana, and Gary was on the summer faculty, just a visiting professor. And he came to a party at which we were doing some demonstrations of continual playing, uh, keyboard improvisation. And he was doing a faculty recital in a few weeks and wanted a harpsichordist who could re realize figured bass. So he said, why don't you come by and we'll do some playing together. And then he told me that he played double bass and I'd never heard of Gary Carr and assumed it would sound like most other double bass players do. And I wasn't particularly interested in going to play. And uh, one day I was just walking down the hall and couldn't think of a convenient excuse when I bumped into Gary and he said, come in and read through some music with me. And I did and uh, that was the beginning. My mother had five sisters, and they were all musical, and so were their children, and both of my brothers studied music as well, and so that if Gary and I are anywhere within five or six hundred miles of my family doing a concert, they, they like to show up. It just so happened that my brother lived in Galveston, and uh, this was a place that was close enough for my family, and we were doing a concert there, so it provided a, a gathering place for the whole family. traveling, the one thing that I'm really eager to see is the architecture. And I find uh, Galveston to be particularly interesting. And what's even more interesting is that Galveston is one of the major shipping ports, it has been for a hundred years. And so that the kind of people that came to live in the city were people representing all the major countries of the world. The most formal room in the house is the gold room. If you could come on in and just group around. Don't be afraid of the carpet, although it is the only original carpet in the home. The room is composed entirely almost of ornate features which came from Paris, France in 1859 and installed by French artisans. It's called the Gold Room for obvious reasons. There's 22 karat gold leaf on all the features of the room. Now, this center chandelier was originally equipped with gas lighting. In 1882, Mr. Brown found that electricity was a new fad in town, but he thought it was just going to be a gas. The painting that shocked the ladies the most was the pair of nude cupids in the corner here. 
The cupids have to be placed somewhere out of view because the nudity offended the very socially upright Victorian ladies of the time. carry Hershey bars in my base and I get a fix before I go on and there have been those days when I forgot my Hershey bar and you know what happened I played terribly I was amazed the first time I heard them because I had no idea that a bass could have such melodious tones as comes out of a bass. They used to say cho uh, chocoholics, mm -hmm. if you really like it. But it, that word is now passe. It's chocophiliac. You're a chocophiliac. I'm a chocophiliac. I used to be a closet chocophiliac, but now I admit it in public. And that vibrato that he talked about, you know, that soul to it, really, mm -hmm. instead of just, you know, anything to it. It was just, he can make it talk, for sure. That's <laughs> better. <laughs> Well, the first thing I have to get going is my head. My body at this age is already so formed to the double bass that really muscularly there's not much I can do. In fact, it's, it's one of the really great regrets in my life from a purely physical standpoint. I want to do so much more. On the other hand, there's a, a daily need that I realize I have to observe, and that's the fact that my brain has to really get going, mostly in terms of intonation. So I spend um, the early part of each day at least uh, an hour devoted to nothing but intonation. I play scales and thirds and sixths, and then I finish by playing Bach. Bach is a composer I don't have to do anything with. I don't have to interpret it. I don't have to shape it. All I do is have to get out of the way of the music. That's very difficult. Get out of the way and just let the music express itself. Then I work on repertoire. I uh, will spend about another hour or so uh, working on uh, programs that I might be preparing, and maybe as much as a year in advance. Right now I'm re uh, preparing for a recording that I'm going to do in a not-too-distant future of the Dvorak Cello Concerto, something which um, I think is a bizarre idea, but I'm doing it in Japan with the Osaka Philharmonic, and, and this is something they've been trying to get me to do for two years, so I finally sat down and learned it. Um, and I struggle away at that. And then um, later on the day, Harmon and I work every, every day together either on the piano, um, harpsichord, and sometimes we'll travel to a church where there's a fine organ and we'll work with the organ. Start a game for me. Yeah. I yeah. think it's fast. I have to think it's too fast, Maybe, too. Yeah. And that should be legato. I got another idea. Just a minute, I want to try something. No, that doesn't work. That's I like that. I like the, no, the I've sound. got another flute. Yeah, then I can do a... Uh... Really, I'm an organist. 
And so I teach organ and harpsichord and continue on improvisation at the Hart School of Music, part-time, of course, since we're traveling so much. And most of what I do actually in the way of being an organist is I, I do some substitute work from time to time. Go back to us where we are in a you at there. 20, uh, 23. Try it, 23. Do you think a different I, sound. Are you going to change sounds during the piece? Yeah, I would change sounds at this mm. point if, if we did mm. it. I didn't have it on. I, I think the try simplicity it. of it is nice just all the way through. Well, try it just, just to change. 20, do you say? No, 23. 20, 21, 22. 20. Yeah. Dude, let's take a little bit before that so we get a feeling of it. Maybe 16. Try one more sound. Would that be too chiffy? 16? No. No, I like okay, it. Okay, try it. to keep my hand in doing a harpsichord recital and an organ recital every year at the school and I don't concentrate much on solo playing besides that anymore. Actually what we do with the duo and keeping our lives organized and keeping up with the correspondence, Gary's better than I am about that, but uh, he, oh I don't know, he does some 40 letters a week and when they need typing, I do that as well. There's, there's not a whole lot of time left over for me to uh, concentrate on playing my own things. Well, the garden we do together. Uh, Gary's a better planner than I am. I'll do a lot of the planting. And, uh, well, we both like doing all this outdoor work. I think it's really great fun cutting your own firewood from a place like this. The problem is I'm not, I'm not here long enough to cut all of it. Uh, I can't use my chainsaw and then immediately go right inside and practice. I have to wait at least half a day before I can practice again. Last spring we spent some time at home and I guess for about two weeks we were planting at least two or three new things in the garden every day. Just starting out the day doing that and then practicing right after planting. I become very jealously guarding of my time at home. And if anybody intrudes on it too much I, I can get very upset. As a youth in California, everybody had a car, and when I went to high school, we all had cars, so it was a real image thing. In fact, I've never met a Californian that wasn't fascinated with cars, except for my father. 
who drove a 1939 Plymouth for 25 years and was a great source of embarrassment to the entire family. And uh, so I, I was determined that when I could afford it, I was going to get the biggest and fanciest cars that I could possibly drive. And since that time, I've fulfilled that wish. <laughs> this, this car is a real boat. I have to have a large car to fit the double base. And in fact, this is such a monster, it'll fit three bases in just inside the cabin. I, I just got this one yesterday, so it's my new toy. I, I don't mind the rigors of travel at all. I'm on the road about nine months out of the year, and when I'm not traveling, I'm teaching. And when I am traveling, I'm always going to wonderful places, and, but places only are so-so. They're not all that important, I don't think. I mean, I really love seeing the whole world, but I think what I really love is, is meeting people, and, and that's what makes traveling a joy. <laughs> States is such a big country and we have so many fascinating places to play and one doesn't always have to be so establishment oriented I don't always have to play in New York and and Chicago and Los Angeles there are many really wonderful places that that don't mind when I perform Kusevitsky or Dragonetti Concerto for instance the Dragonetti Concerto which I think is a fantastic technical vehicle but it has a gorgeous slow movement in it that I can really sing on I'm going to get to play that in Boise Idaho and I love Boise, Idaho. There's a, they have a very spirited orchestra in such a beautiful place. The surrounding mountains are something splendid and I, I love going there. I get very annoyed about a, a prevailing attitude in music uh, about with regard to repertoire, because obviously if I'm going to play a whole evening of double bass repertoire, it'll be pieces nobody ever heard. I'll play that, I'll try that, and they say, eh, you know, it's too bad he has only bass pieces to play in their kind of inferior music. What a shame. What difference does it make? <laughs> I can make it sound any way I want to make it sound. I can be very creative, and I am very creative with that kind of piece, and I like to do it, and I wish they'd recognize the fact that I'm an artistic force. I think it's the role of a performer uh, not only just to interpret the music, and, and, and to realize the composer's intention. I really think an, uh, an important obligation for every performer is to respond to it. And what he should convey to the audience is not only the music, but his own response to it, how he feels about the music.
my best slide, Jim what is this then? What's this Ducks Unlimited? Well, that's a conservation organization that preserves waterfowl habitat. It's very, it's very popular in Britain. Very popular I got, I got in Britain. scared. I mean, when I saw ducks and was very pain, I thought, oh God, there's a fellow who shoots ducks. He does. Oh, you can serve him by shooting him. It's like the old question, ask me how I feel. Ask me how I feel. How do you feel? Don't ask. <laughs> Normally I'm a violist. That was Idaho City. Great, beautiful, fantastic place. I'm an easy, fairly calm individual with a strong inner emotional intensity. I find the most problematical thing in the world is just living with myself. I don't find anybody else too much of a problem. I'm easily hurt by people, I guess, um, but uh, the, the, my defense for that is keeping so busy I don't know what people are saying. <laughs> I don't think I'm any different in that respect. This instrument is brand new. It was made uh, just recently in Tokyo. And the Japanese maker is Satomoto. It's the most beautiful instrument that I've yet played on. New instrument. But you have to look at this one next to it because you'll notice that they're twins. That instrument is the greatest double bass probably in existence, made by Hieronymus and Antonius Amati in the year 1611. 
When I gave my debut concert in New York uh, more than two decades ago, unbeknownst to me in the audience was the wife of the widow of Serge Kusevitsky, who was best noted as a conductor, but before that was an internationally known double bass soloist. He performed on his beloved Amadi. And uh, after the concert, I didn't meet the woman, so I didn't know what she looked like. I certainly didn't know what she sounded like. And the next day when I received a telephone call from this woman who said, with a very thick Russian accent, Hello, this is Mrs. Kusevitsky calling. I thought it was a friend of mine playing a practical joke on me, so I said to her, Yeah, baby, I'll bet. And, and uh, she thought that was very funny, and then she said, Would you come to my apartment? Of course I showed up. She then said, and I can hardly believe that she said this, but it's the truth. She said, The reason I invited you here is because after having heard you last night, I feel that, that you're the only one who should have this double bass, and I would like to give it to you as a gift. And now it's mine. I like playing my Japanese bass, and I would like to in concert, but everybody wants to hear the Amati, so I have to travel with the Amati. <laughs> She has become a, a very close friend of mine uh, over a period of more than a decade. Um, we, we were, in fact, practically housed together in Victoria, British Columbia. And we started working together and performing a crazy piece by Bottasini, this grand duo concertante. And, and since then, we've performed it all over the world <laughs> together. And he is so much fun. He is just one of the few musicians I know that's really completely down to earth. He, he just loves what he does, and he does it with a tremendous amount of passion, but he's just basically a regular guy, and we've had a lot of fun spending time together. Again. You have to listen to this because this is bel canto. It's so beautiful. We, I, I mean, I have to come in and I have to imitate you, so I have to hear it again. It's so beautiful. You mean you, you want to give me another listen chance? Listen to this is what I, I this is what I want you people to do. This is called singing. You know, I mean, this is it's absolutely incredible. Italian. It's so beautiful. <laughs> do it again. I'm glad you have to tell them. They have to listen. <laughs> if I don't tell them, they won't hear. You know, that you're hearing something very special. You've got to hear this again. Maybe. Okay.
About a quarter of a century ago, Yehudi Menuhin purchased a chalet in Gestad, Switzerland. And at that time, he invited a bunch of his friends to come to Gestad and, and play together. And it turned out that the local people and people who come here as tourists thought it'd be a terrific place to have a festival. So the Gestad Festival began um, more than 25 years ago. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I'm having my first <laughs> first <laughs> encounter encounter with the, with this, these beasts. I met Yehudi Menuhin a number of years ago in Hong Kong. He had attended a concert of mine and came backstage and we started talking and it was immediately apparent that we shared a lot in common about our basic approach to the instrument. I can only play an open string. How well, do you that's hold not it? This bad. way? That's good enough. Like shaking hands. Like uh, like like that. No. Well, that's not, not quite. That, no. no, no, let's see. If I go shake it, let's shake hands for you. Yeah. How do you do? How do you do? <laughs> How do you do? Have, no, you had it. That's it. Perfect. That way? Yes. Just sort of. No. And my pillow. Change notes. <laughs> <laughs> And there's, a, there's an opening in the Berlin Symphony Orchestra, which you would like to audition. <laughs> I love the lowest note. Yes, me too. It's my favorite note. It is. Lean against it really tight. In here. Doesn't that, doesn't that feel delicious against your stomach? Beautiful. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Do double bass yes, players ever suffer indigestion? No, because we have this. Of course, you have this, this, this natural aid, vibration. This natural vi yes. But does the violin? Is are there any notes uh, that feel that good? It's our heart that vibrates, not our stomach. Oh, what a shame! <laughs> <laughs> The double bass is such a physical instrument. It's so large, and there's so many things we have to um, try and, and try and understand in order to use our body intelligently. This immediately put us on the same wavelength because he thinks so much about his use of the body. Well, I was wondering one thing about uh, violin is that we have a problem in this instrument that none of the string players have. Um, because the size of it, uh, one aspect of the size that a lot of people don't think about is that sound is further away from us than on any of the other instruments. Well, you don't get deaf as violinists do. Gradually, yeah. the longer you play the violin, the more out of tune you get because the deafer you get. What, did, what was that? Could you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> the longer you play the violin. <laughs> because I get over it, I tell you how, by using a mute. Ah. So, because right. even so, I think the left ear hears much more than mm -hmm. the right one. Tell me, this is what I find so enormous, the distance between notes. I don't know how you get around. You play each note with, a, with three fingers, don't you, <laughs> and then move. Well, one octave is... Lock, stock, and barrel to the next yeah. note. Well, look at the distance of one octave. Yes. Well, that far. Yes. How, how far is it on the violin? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's this. It's the compass yeah. of, from first yeah. to fourth finger. That's all, yes. that. Um, also, when, uh, when we vibrate, it's, it's a problem be yes, in how pitch. How do you do that? You've never it's thought of playing the double bass with your feet, because after all, the feet are a little larger than well, hands. Well, do you know you can vibrate with your head? I mean, if you play an open note and shake your head, yeah. you'll hear it as a vibrato. <laughs> Wait. You hear it, but the audience doesn't. Do you hear it? You don't? Yes, I do. <laughs> I do. But, but what if you're in a negative mood and go this way? <laughs> Indian mood. <laughs> don't you find the most fascinating thing about playing, about it, pr presumably any, any technique, any art, any instrument, but particularly with string playing, is the developing of the subtlety of response. In other words, the smallest angle, the smallest weight, the least pressure, the finest balance. Mm. These are the aims, don't you think? Yes, it's, it, and there's one, one reason I, I envy the violin, because the violin's small. Yes. Whereas bass is so large and requires yeah. so much of the body. But you've made the bass, if I may say, chauvinistically, a violin. <laughs> <laughs> because well, it's so delicate little, the way you, you handle know. it. It's so wonderful.
Gestalt is is for me uh, it's it's a healing balm. <laughs> Um, it's, it's something that I really need. It, it's become my vacation time, in fact, because I usually stay on after the festival. And the thing I enjoy more than anything is to walk through the, the hills and the mountains. And every time you take a new turn and you see a new side, I don't know, it just, I feel that uh, it just these vast perspectives just alter things in life and, and make everything seem so unimportant that I just lose myself and I forget myself. Every year that I come here, I've, I've performed a recital with Harmon Lewis, and and then in addition to that, did some chamber music with Manuin and, and other people who come to the festival. But this year is something special because a number of the bass players in the area requested that I do a workshop, and it sort of snowballed and became a rather international double bass workshop in Gestad. So for about eight or nine days uh, this year, I'm holding a workshop just to study double bass. We have sort of a routine in, in, in this workshop, and it's a lot of work. Let me tell you, we, we've been playing um, 8 to 12 hours a day, and, I, and a lot of the bass players are really exhausted because they're not used to that sort of thing. For instance, we start every single morning with an hour and a half of very laborious and painful exercises. That's good. These boring exercises, which are so necessary, when you get a large group together and you watch how painful it is for everybody else, it somehow makes the time go by more quickly. No, you're doing it with the arm, you know? I could, I could always hear it because when you get a certain kind of sound when you go like this, or like this, or like this. There's so many different, you can... You can I've always considered teaching an important part of my life. Um, and, and as I grow older, it becomes even more and more important because it's my one contact that I have with what's happening in this world. And what's happening in this world is always to be found in, in our youth. What I want is a physical body sound, which means doing this, lifting everything on top of it, because for this you need everything you have. Yes. You hear the difference? It's a fuller sound. Yeah, okay. Now, if you had it, and you have to follow it all the way down, the most important note in that whole cadenza is the note that every audience is waiting for the bass to make, the lowest note. So it has to be beautiful. Take your time. When I have 
to teach, I, first of all, I have to deal with some of my own problems and I have to work it out and figure it out. So when I finally help a student solve it, I go home and I improve. I'm so selfish about it in a way. I feel guilty because while I'm helping them, I'm the one that seems to be benefiting the most. Make a square bowing because then you have time to, to sit on each note. One ultimate uh, objective that I had was to convey a certain concept of sound, an approach to the sound of the double bass, which may be a bit different from tradition. I believe in a focused, clear, beautiful, warm, uh, rich sound. Not that it hasn't always been there, but with a bit of an edge to it so that it projects really well. I want to get that first one right because you always go. Uh, uh, what the, the technique for doing that, the long note you play toward the bridge. The next you bring back the bow this much. That's all. Just lift it back that much, that's all. And then and the bow will come back the complete direction. So And then you don't have that accent. No, 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 no. Don't do it on the note. After. What's really fun is that as part of the course, I'm working all the bass players toward an event, a very special event, when we're all 15 of us this time. We're all going to actually play together in a concert at the end of this workshop. The students have come from all over Europe. There are some German ones and Swiss and English and so on. And the interesting thing is that they all have a different approach to the double bass, which makes it really interesting. And I, in a way, have to unify what they're doing because I'm trying to convey something that I do. And we're all bending, we're all flexing a great deal. One of the really neat things about Gestad, which came as a great surprise to me, is the fact that the double bass has a folk image. Because if you go to any cafe anywhere in Switzerland, there will be a real double bass in the corner. And I met one wonderful, I call him a character. He's just a great, sensitive, beautiful human being by the name of Kirby Bach, who, in addition to playing double bass, plays the musical saw. And so one time I said, we've got to play it together. 
Someone once told me that you know a concert should be really just a passing phase in someone's life. To me, it's it's almost a life and death thing. I really I, I put myself on the line when I perform. I mean, playing the double bass is so difficult to begin with, and I really like to walk out as close to the end of that branch I possibly limb or whatever, however you call it, <laughs> as close to the end as I can before it'll break. And I love that. I love that. It, there's a sense of danger, and it's a life and death thing. It really is. Thank you. 